Hey, let's jump in today, and we're going to conclude this thing out. I'm going to try to roll through this as fast as possible, uh, and we're going to go. So today, we are concluding with two different habits here, and it is wind the clock and seed the clouds. Wind the clock and seed the clouds. We're going to kick off with wind the clock. Many years ago, Dr. Tony Campolo was teaching a class at the University of Pennsylvania when he turned an ordinary lecture into an unforgettable lesson. He asked students sitting on the front row, young man, how long have you lived? Well, the unsuspecting student answering his age said, no, 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 said uh, Tony Campolo. He said, that's how long your heart has been pumping blood. That's not how long you've lived. That's when Tony Campolo told the class a story uh, about one of the most memorable moments in his life. In 1944, his fourth grade class took a field trip to the top of the Empire State Building, tallest building in the world at the time. Uh, when nine-year-old Tony got off the elevator, walked out onto the observation deck overlooking New York City, time stood still. If I lived a million years, said Tony Campolo, that moment will still be part of my consciousness because I was fully alive when I lived it. Tony turned back to the same student and said, now let me ask the same question again. How long have you lived? When you say it that way, the student said, maybe an hour, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. Let me start by asking you these two questions. How old are you? And how long have you lived? Now, these questions sound similar, but they could not be further apart from each other. The first is much easier to calculate. Well, let me say this, at least for those of us that do not lie about our age, all right? Hey, listen, if you lie about your age, no shame in your game. I get it. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, here in a couple months, I will be 30, and so I will start lying about my age at that point. Uh, I think I'll probably start going back until I'm about 21 and then just stay right there, okay? But our, our age is a little bit easier to calculate. It's a little bit easier to quantify. It's much easier harder to answer the second question of how long have you lived? And here's why. Because time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. Time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. So many of us are stuck in the wrong time zone of life. We're so worried about past mistakes, past regrets, things that I wish I could do over, things I wish I could have said that we miss moments in the, in the present right now. Or maybe we're so anxious about the future, about what could be, the what ifs, what if this happens, what if I take the wrong step, what if I go the wrong direction, what if I don't say the right thing when I'm in this meeting, it could cost me this, that, and the other. And because we get so focused and wrapped up on the future that we miss the moments that God wants us to be a part of right here and right now. Life is more about moments than it is minutes. And I think if we can wrap our mind around the fact that it's not about the 24 hours that I have in a day necessarily, but it's more about how do I make the best out of those 24 hours. Our mind needs to shift on that. Because we daily miss a miracle after miracle that God is doing because we are too busy doing. We miss miracles that God is doing because we are too busy doing. We're too busy with making sure we're at this place and at that time and going here and going there that we miss the moments that God has for us most. Before we wind the clock, though, we have to understand that, number one, time is a human construct. 2 Peter 3.8 3, says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. We have to remember that God created us in His image, not the other way around. Oftentimes we try to put God in our box, and we try to put Him on our time frame and our time schedule. But you can't put the creator of something in a box. You can't tell the creator of this super nice painting how much he should price it or where he, where he should hang it or what museum it should go in because why? He created it. It's his to display. And we have to remember this. The most important thing at all is that God 
never changes. So our times change, things move, things shift. There's different things in our life, yet God remains the same. He's the same yesterday, today, forevermore. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end, meaning that God does not work on our time frame. God moves in and out of time. Why? Because he created it, number one. But then number two, he sees it from the beginning to the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Number two, we live forward, but God lives backwards. There's a fancy word in philosophy called teleology. I think I said that right. Don't quote me. But it's the beginning with the end in mind. And that's who God is. That is what God does. When God created at the very beginning of time, he was thinking about the end, about the moment that we would be reconnected with him face to face. He was thinking about the moment that he would get to have a relationship with us. He was thinking about the moment that you were sitting right here at VCC. He was thinking about you. And we can look at exactly how God does this and how we see this play out in Scripture. How we like to move one direction forward, but God is always looking backwards. In the New Testament, there's Jesus, and he says this. He says, before Abraham, before, before Abraham was I am. Simply meaning this, when Jesus said I am, he's saying that I am God. That, that I am God. I am, I'm the one who God sent. He is me. I am him. Another example is in Joshua 6, 2. This is in the Old Testament. And God is talking to the Israelites and he says, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Past tense. Not present tense, not future. Past tense. He says, I have delivered. Not I will. This is before they were getting ready to go up against Jericho. I have delivered. Not I will. Because God has already seen it happen before it actually happened. God wants you to get where God wants you to go more than you want to get where God wants you to go. Say that one more time. It's a little bit confusing. God wants you to get where God wants you to go more than you want to get where God wants you to go. Meaning that he knows you better than you know yourself. Meaning that there's nothing that you will do, there's nothing that you will say that will shock God. He knows exactly the right place and the right time that he needs you to be, but we have to learn to be in the moment. Stop focusing so much on the clock and start focusing on the moment that we're in, whether that's with our kids, whether that's with you know, our friends, whatever it may be. We can get so focused on tomorrow that we miss today. Number three, everything is created twice. Any idea, breakthrough, or miracle, it happens twice. It first happens internal, spiritual, and mental. And then after that, what it does is it shows itself evident in the physical. So you first have to think about an idea. And then once that idea is there, once that idea has been given to you from God, you then have to put it into action. So every idea has happened twice. Here's what I know for sure. We live at the intersection of two theologies, two realities. The faithfulness of God is pursuing us from the past. The sovereignty of God is setting us up for the future. And we live where those two theologies and realities intersect. So far, so God. The best is yet to come. I think what I'm getting at is, is this. You are here for such a time as this. You are here for such a time in a place as this. God has placed you exactly where you need to be. So how are you stewarding the moment? How are you making the best of your time? Are we being wasteful? Are we being lazy? Are we sleeping all day long? Which I listen, I would love to sleep all day long. Many of you guys know that have kids, you probably don't get much sleep. Every night around four o'clock, Carter comes in and he gets in bed with us. And Carter doesn't just like to lay in bed. And many of your kids, I'm sure, are like this, but they don't just lay still. How many of your kids are like that? When they get in your bed, they can't just be still. They have to kick, they have to push, they have to grab your ear if you're Carter. He likes to just hold on to my ear and squeeze it real tight. Wakes me up every time, so then I'm up earlier than I want to be up. 
But what I know is this is just because Carter is trying to wake me up, even though he doesn't know it, it doesn't mean that my day gets any less crazy or busy or hectic. I have to start doing a better job of managing my time. Because here's what I know. If we can get focused on the minutes, or we can get our, our minds shifted off of the minutes, and we can get focused more on the moments, here's what I know is this. God can do more in one day than you can accomplish in a thousand lifetimes. Excuse me. <coughs> God can do more in one day than you can accomplish in a thousand lifetimes. Meaning you can work as hard as you want, and we believe that you should work hard in everything that you do because we have our saying that we say a lot around here is we pray like it depends on God, but we work like it depends on us. And so God wants you to work hard, but don't forget that apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from the Holy Spirit leading, guiding, directing us, we can do nothing. And it's our job to make sure that we are constantly spending time praying, seeking so that we can know exactly what moments we need to be a part of. With all that being said, we just talked about not necessarily focusing on the minutes, but focusing on the moments, but now we do need to wind the clock. Ephesians 5, 16 says this, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So be careful how you live. Think about the way that you are living. Think about how you are going about your day. Think about what each minute may look like. Because if we are not careful, if we are not on guard, there is a real enemy. There is a real enemy out there who is roaring. Or he's, he's, he's trying to find you. He's, he's going around searching like a roaring lion, trying to see who he can devour. And oftentimes we get so busy and so wrapped up with life that we miss moments to actually spend time in the Word so that we can be prepared when the enemy throws his attacks. We miss the moments with God and then we wonder why we are always being attacked and we don't have a defense against it. Your defense is making sure that you're prayed up. Your defense is making sure that you're spending time in the Word making sure that we know what God's word is. When it comes to time, write this one down. You don't find time, you make it. You don't find the time to do stuff, you make the time to do stuff. Every year for most people, right, the New Year's resolution is this. What? Lose more weight, go to the gym, work out more. That's my New Year's resolution as well. And if I'm not careful, I can get caught up in saying, oh, well, I just didn't have the time today. I just didn't have the time today. No, I just didn't want to get up out of my bed at five o'clock in the morning. Let's just be real. That alarm clock goes off, snooze, 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 until Alyssa wakes me up and says, hey, you didn't go to the gym. It's time to go to work now. And so then I roll up out of bed and we go. I have the time. I just have to make sure that I'm making the time. Get it, it, the, the, the phrase, I have to find the time, is funny to me. You don't have to find the time. There's the same 24 hours every single day. You know how long each day is going to be. Okay, so let's not make the excuse of finding the time and let's start making time. And how do we, how do, we do this? How do we make time? And I'm going to try to speed through this last little bit so we can move on quickly here. Uh, the first way that you do this is, number one, you curse the barren fig tree. In the New Testament, there's a miracle that takes place and, and Jesus is walking past a, a fig tree that he was hungry and there was no fruit growing on the fig tree. And so as he's walking by, he basically says, hey, you're not doing your job, you're dead. And he curses the tree and it withers away. Many of us need to start cursing the barren fig trees in our life. Because here's what I know that faithfulness, if you want to know if you're faithful to God, faithfulness is fruitfulness. So what fruit are you producing in your life? What fruit is coming out of your life? Is it kindness? Is it generosity? Is it love? Is it grace? What fruits are you producing? If you want to know if you're faithful to God, what are you producing? You have to start by figuring out how much time you spend on things. The average person spends about two and a half hours on social media a day. Some of you just realized you are above average and not in a good way. 
How many of y'all get that notification every week of how much time you spend on stuff, and then you're like, oh, I spent four hours a day on social media today. That's a new record. <laughs> it's easy to do. I've gotten sucked into the world of TikTok. Listen, there's a screen printing thing on there. They have an account, and I'll watch that thing all day if I'm not careful. It's addicting. It happens. But my job is to make sure that my life is fruitful. So I can't say that I don't have the time if I've spent two hours just on my phone scrolling. I have to begin to make the time for the things that are most important. How do we curse the barren fig tree? We have to learn to establish boundaries and priorities. Some of you guys need to learn this hard reality that you need to let your yes be yes and your no be no. Every time that you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to another and vice versa. And some of us were really good at people pleasing. Y'all are very good people pleasers. And so you just say yes to everything and everyone because I just, I, I can't take saying no. Listen, that's where burnout happens. That's where anxiety happens. That's where depression happens because we don't establish good boundaries. And so then the fruit that begins to come out of us, it begins to wither away and it's not there anymore. Number two, you have to do the math. You have to do the math. You have to do a better understanding of what, uh, what is the value of importance. We put a lot of importance on things that just don't simply matter. As Carter's getting older, he's wanting to do more things. He's wanting to play. He's wanting to go places. He's wanting to this and that. I have to do a better job of not making excuses to miss those moments because that is what matters. My family time the way that I lead my family, making sure that my family is growing up in a right way, that they're growing up in a Christian home, that I'm leading Carter along the right path, that is the thing that matters the most. Not the outside things, not you know, making sure other things are getting done outside of my house. The thing that matters the most is when I'm home is that I make sure that I'm locked in with my family, whether we're doing a game night, whether we're doing a movie night, whether Carter just wants to play with his squishies. If you don't know what squishies are, don't worry about it. You'll have to ask him later. I'm sure he's got a couple of them with him. But I have to make sure that I remember the value of importance and making sure that what I'm putting first in my life is the most important thing. Remove the things that are not important. There's a word in the Greek used called kairos. Kairos means make the most of every opportunity or redeem the time. How do we manage moments or wind the kairos clock? Because kairos, it does not mean chronological time. It does not mean how, you know, it's not your minutes, your months, your days, your years, okay? It's redeeming those moments. It's how do we, want, how do we wind up the clock of kairos to, so that we don't miss the most important moments in our life? Is number one, we do this, we... Uh, we steward teachable moments. And number two, we accumulate experiences. So number one, we steward teachable moments, meaning that we look for the opportunities and moments that we can teach those around us, that we can have people learning about what is most important. I want to take moments with Carter at a young age. He turns four tomorrow, and it's so crazy how fast that goes. And you parents, you guys understand that, and you know. Uh, I feel like he was just born, but now he's starting to get to the age where he's learning, he's developing. He's starting to understand things a little bit better. So it's my job, it's my responsibility to make sure that I am teaching him the right things in the right moment and at the right time. And guess what? Also with the right attitude. How many of you parents know that it's really quick and easy to snap on your kids when you've had a long day? Oh, no, me. I'm just the bad parent. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for leaving me hanging. Appreciate that. I feel it right here. It's easy to snap on your kid to take it out when they, you've told them five times to do something. They still haven't done it. And you just, what are you doing? Do it right the first time, blah, 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 whatever. It's real easy to do that. But it's my responsibility, my job to come alongside my child and teach him the right way to do things. Number two, accumulate experiences. Don't accumulate possessions, accumulate experiences. My fondest memories of growing up as a kid have nothing to do with what my parents bought me. There's stuff that was involved with it, 
I think I've told the story before about one Christmas I got this little, it's kind of like a Nerf gun shooter, but it shot these discs. And I was so excited about them as a kid. And uh, that day, the rest of the day, me and my dad, all we did was run around our house, jumping on the couch, like, you know, like we were like James Bond or something, like, you know, turn aside sideways, shooting them. And we just shot each other all day with those dumb little discs. It was the most fun that I had ever had in, at that moment. And I still remember fondly today. I remember going to a Royals game with my dad and uh, we were there at a rain delay and it was the coolest moment ever because we were there at the Royals game and they played the movie, The Natural. How many of you guys have ever seen The Natural? One of my favorite baseball movies of all time. It's great. And they played it during the game and I got to sit and watch it on the jumbo surround with my dad. There was things that were bought, but that's not what I remember. I remember the moment. I don't want to get to the end of my life and have all this stuff. And, and having stuff is not bad. I get that. But if it's the most important thing in your life, something has to change. Something has to shift. Don't accumulate possessions. Accumulate experiences. I'm going to flip the script here real quick. And we're going to move on to our second habit. Seed the clouds. You guys ready for the second part? Seed the clouds? Okay. On November 13th, 1946, a single propeller airplane took off from the Scandinavian, hopefully I said that right, uh, county airport with, uh, with a rather unique payload. Six pounds of dry ice and a rather unique mission. The pilot was a chemist named Vincent Schaefer who had been conducting uh, clandestine uh, experiments at General Electric Research Laboratory. Using a GE freezer chilled to sub-zero temperatures, Schaefer created clouds using his breath as condensation and seeded those man-made clouds with dry ice. The dry ice catalyzed a, catalyzed a chemical reaction that caused snow crystals to form within the freezer. A few moments later, it was time for a field test. So Schaefer rented uh, the aforementioned airplane it flew it into a cumulus cloud and dumped the dry ice. Uh, eyewitness said on the ground that it looked like a cloud exploded. The snowfall was visible for 40 miles away. The GE monogram had a little bit of fun with Schaefer's benchmark uh, breakthrough. It said Schaefer made it snow this afternoon over Pittsfield. Next week, he walks on water. So here's this guy, basically, he goes up and he makes this cloud and he makes it snow, right? He seeded the cloud. He gave the cloud what it, need, what it needed to be able to do what it needed to do. We're going to jump into 1 Kings here in a minute, but, but let me set the scene for this. Here in, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, it has not rained in Israel for three and a half years. And desperate times call for desperate measures. And so this is when and where and why the prophet Elijah climbs up to the top of Mount Carmel and seeds the clouds with dry ice, sort of. 1 Kings uh, 18, 41 through 46, it says this. Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees and said, go uh, look toward the sea, he said to his servant. And he went back and looked. There was nothing there. And he said seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant said, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. So Elijah shouted, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the, sc the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, let's unpack this a little bit. Let's unpack how you seed the cloud. You see the cloud by, number one, with prophetic imagination. More than half a century ago, Dr. Alfred Tomatis was confronted with the most curious case his 50-year career as an entronologist. A renowned opera singer had lost his ability to hit certain notes, even though those notes were within his vocal range. He had been, uh, he had been to other specialists, all of them thought it was a vocal problem. Dr. Tomatis thought otherwise. Using a sonometer, 
Dr. Demodis discovered that this opera singer was producing 140 decibel sound waves at a meter's distance. That's louder than a military jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. Long story short, the opera singer was defeated by the sound of his own voice. He could no longer hit the notes because he could no longer hear the notes. The voice can only reproduce, Dr. Timotis said, Dr. Timotis said what the ear can hear. Now the French Academy of Medicine called it the Tomatis effect, and the ramifications are pretty profound. Everyone that you interact with on a daily basis that you know is dealing with some sort of problem, big, small, or maybe in between. But everyone that you come in contact with is dealing with something. It might be spiritual, it might be emotional, it might be physical, it might be mental. But we all have problems that we are trying to fight every single day. But I'm convinced that our problem isn't really our problem. The, the, the problem that you think is so big in your life, I'm convinced is, is not really the problem. I believe that nine times out of 10, our root problem is simply hearing. Nine times out of 10, I, I, I'm convinced that it's simply hearing. We get so busy and wrapped up with everything else going on in life that we miss the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life. We miss the voice of God. And so big things, let me rephrase that, little things become big things, and big things become even bigger things because we don't have the time to stop and listen to the Holy Spirit when he's talking and saying, it's okay. I've got everything under control. Hand it over. I've got this. And so we get so busy doing that we try to fix problems that, guess what? Oftentimes only can be fixed in the spiritual. Our problem isn't our actual problem. It's simply hearing the voice of God. What, per what percentage of your thoughts are positive? What percentage are negative? And how much of that are filtered through the word of God? How much are your thoughts filtered through what the Bible says? How much of your thoughts are filtered through what God has declared over your life? That you are a child of God. That the promises of God are yes and amen that you are the head and not the tail. How much of what you're going through right now do you actually take to the word of God and say, I know that this is happening, but I know that your word is true. I know that this is happening. I'm in the middle of it. I feel every little bit of it. But what I know is actually true is that you're there with me every single step of the way. We can't go off our feelings because our feelings will lead us astray. Your feelings do not always mean truth. But the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The same God who saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the same God who wants to deliver for you from the fire that you're standing in right now. But you have to stop and be able to hear Let's look back at verse 41 here. He says, Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. How was Elijah able to hear something that no one else around him could? Because Elijah had a prophetic ear and that's where prophetic imagination comes from. Prophetic imagination is seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible and believing in the impossible. Prophetic imagination is seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible, and believing in the impossible. People thought Elijah was crazy. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. They said, dude, there's no rain, there's no cloud. I don't see it, I don't hear it. What are you talking about? 
But Elijah had a connection with the greatest thing on this planet that you can ever have. He had a connection with the creator, which means that he was able to connect to the source. The one who knows everything. The one who stands above all. The one who is the beginning and the end. He already knew how that story was going to end up. All he said was, Elijah, trust me. Listen to my voice. You know, there's an old axiom. Those who hear not the music think the dancer is mad. There ought to be some moments in our lives where people think we're crazy. Why? Because we don't operate the way that the world does. We operate out of the prophetic imagination. Number two, how do we seed the cloud? With patient persistence. Patient persistence. There's a balancing act, I believe, that we're supposed to walk in as Christians. And it's finding the balance between, between waiting and walking. There's, there's, there's a balancing act there, right? So I'm, I'm supposed to wait on the Word of God, but I still have to walk forward towards the Word of God. I still have to walk forward in the calling that God has placed on my life. But, but So how do I wait? How do I bring a persistence to my life while I'm still saying, God, I'm just waiting here for you? I think, and this is not theological, this is literally just my opinion on how this works. I believe that when we bring something to God's attention, when we, when we start asking God for prayer, we say, God, I want this family member to know you. I want to see this family member come to have a relationship with you. I believe that God says, okay, cool, I hear that, boom. And he places it down here and he goes, keep praying, keep seeking, keep knocking, and keep walking forward. It may take 10 years, it may take 30 years, it may take five years, it may take a week, but I'm gonna be patient and believe and know that God has everything under control and in the palm of his hand. Number three, how do we seed the cloud? With bold prayers. How do we see the cl cloud with, with bold prayers? I'm gonna close with this. In 853 BC, a king named Jerome, Jerome assumes the throne of Judah. He's the fifth king of the southern kingdom. It's 117 years after the death of David. And this is what 2 Kings uh, verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 18 says. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Jerome... Uh, actually killed his brothers so that he could get the throne. But that's not the end of the story. Here's what it says. Nevertheless, nevertheless, for David's sake, for David's sake, for David's sake. That little phrase reappears half a dozen times in the Kings and in the Chronicles. It says, for David's sake, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. This is so powerful to me because David is long gone this is six kings later, but God does not forget his promises. God does not forget his people. Can I suggest to you this morning that you're living in the promises and blessings that you do not deserve? But someone generations ago took the time to pray for you, took the time to intercede for you, and now you are standing on the promises, even though you don't deserve them, simply because somebody else took the time to make sure that you were prayed for. Look back in the, in the Old Testament, and you look at this in the, in the Kings here, and God made a promise to David. Six Kings later, God still kept his word. If God said it, he means it. If God said it, it's gonna happen. You can trust that. You can rely on, on that. If God said it, it's done. We have to begin praying bold prayers. Here's what I know. Small prayers do not honor God. Bold ones do. Because when I pray a bold prayer and I'm saying, God, I don't know how this is going to happen. God, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to make it happen, but I believe you can. When we pray those type of prayers, God says, cool, now let me get to work. 
When we pray those type of prayers, God says, cool, now let me do what I can do. Now that you realize you can do nothing apart from me, let me show you what I can do. Maybe a bold prayer for you needs to be that your family will know Jesus. Maybe a bold prayer for you is that you're going to get that promotion at work. Maybe a bold prayer for you is you're going to get a new house. It doesn't look like you can afford it. It doesn't look like, I don't know where the money's going to come, but a bold prayer is that this is going to happen. A bold prayer for us as a church is that one day we will have a building here in in Grain Valley that we can have church at, and we can do things throughout the week at, and it can be a beacon of hope for our community. Those are bold prayers. I don't know if you've driven around Grain Valley much, but there ain't much available. But if God said it, he's going to do it. If God said it, it's done. You want to honor God? You want to seed the cloud? Pray bold prayers. Believe that God can do what he said he's going to do. Amen.